open up our band leading us in worship. We're kind of calling this the Next Gen Sunday. Uh, it's good to see Jordan, Josh, Titus, Bailey, and man, what, what, a, what an honor and a privilege to get to see that next generation being brought up in our church. Isn't that amazing that God has blessed us with this level? At our church, we say it over and over again that we want to invest in the next generation, whether it's the next generation of, of believers, the next teenager that walks in, the next kid that walks into the zone upstairs, whether it's a, a family walking in that needs to know about Jesus or needs to center their marriage on godly principles versus worldly principles. The next generation is the next generation, and, and that's what it's all about. For those of you that are new and you see that graphic, for the 107. If you go out to our, our website and just search that, it'll explain a little bit more. But the 107 is the, is the one that Jesus leaves the 99 to go find that one. And that's what, man, our church is all about, is trying to find those ones that absolutely need rescue and restoration. Uh, today is a special day uh, because one of our staff that was raised up in this church, one of our elders' daughters that serves as our zone pastor. Um, she is um, definitely an all-star diamond uh, on the rise, and, and we wanted to let her have the opportunity because she's been doing so well speaking up in the zone and, and fuse on Wednesday nights that we felt like we were going to let her come on the stage today and share a word with you. And, and I know from first service that you guys are getting ready to hear God encourage you on how you can live a better life and overcome opposition. So if you guys would, would you guys put your hands together and welcome Jesse Galata Kilbane to the stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we also just take a second just to um, honor Pastor Tim and Pastor Carrie for all of the sacrifice that they pour into Genesis Metro Church on a weekly basis. So for today's message, um, I titled it Overcoming Opposition. Overcoming Opposition. We're going to take a look at a story um, of a man named ne Nehemiah who went back to his hometown uh, to rebuild a wall. And as we look at that phrase, overcoming opposition, I just wanted to, uh, you know, ask you guys some questions just to kind of set the table for today's message. Have you ever, you know, tried to do something right and it ended up going very wrong? I can think about this um, for with mo one moment in particular. Uh, I had bought uh, a $2,000 value couch for like a steal of a deal of like $200. And so I asked my friends, I was like, hey guys, can you come help me take this huge heavy couch from Deep Ellum all the way back to Frisco, Texas? And they're like, they're so nice. They're like, yeah, sure, yeah, we'll definitely do it. And they show up with like one singular bungee cord to get this in the truck and make sure it stays. And I'm like, oh, this could go very wrong as we're driving down DNT. I was like, oh no. And what, what we thought would be like, you know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half of like moving this couch from one place to another turned into like a three hour long scene from friends of us just being like, pivot, pivot, like back and forth to each other, right? And so sometimes, we, we think what might be going right could be going very wrong, but I think this closely, uh, closely mirrors our, our spiritual lives. And have you ever tried to do a godly thing and live a godly life and you are met with things just going very wrong? I think about that in a lot of different aspects of our life. You know, there, there's people that have come and they're they're serving this morning on a Sunday and uh, they were doing the right thing and then they're handed like a crying baby or maybe they they open the door to the fridge and they see that you know what we're out of that creme brulee coffee creamer that everybody loves and that's all that they were going to hear about this morning or maybe it's that that person that you know they didn't want to come to church this morning but they did so anyway and the entire ride there they fought with their spouse or maybe it's those kids. I think about all the kids that went to camp this summer from our zone age kids to our few students that are sitting right here in this room. And they had these life-changing experiences at camp, but then they come home and, and they're met with the, the temptation of just um, 
you know, social media or even bad influences. You know, I think we might start to think that it could be easy because we're doing it for God. But just because that we're doing a good thing doesn't actually mean that everything's going to go well. We can take a look at different characters in the Bible and just look at their biography and see that just because they decided to follow God doesn't mean that everything in their life was going to just be sunshine and rainbows. That oftentimes they were going to be met with more obstacles than they thought that they would be. So today we're going to take a look at the story of that man named Nehemiah and see how he handled the opposition, but also how he, overco- how he overcame it. We're going to take a look in uh, chapter 4 of Nehemiah. When Sanibal heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? So as they're rebuilding this wall, Sanibal, who's, who's the enemy, who's on the outside, and he's not with God's people of Judah or, or the Israelites, and he's saying, you know what, how are they even going to be able to do this? Are they even strong enough? He said, will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Is, is what they're doing today even going to make a difference tomorrow? He said, will they finish in a day? He, he questioned how long it was going to take them. So as, as Nehemiah was out there doing the Lord's work, putting down brick by brick by brick in the heat of the day, Now, if that wasn't hard work already, now he's having to face the taunts of the enemy. And I think we need to be reminded that we need to expect opposition. I wonder how many times that you've been in that place, that someone has maybe questioned you. Maybe they've questioned your your toughness or your talent. Maybe they've questioned your personality, or your perseverance. I think about this for one time for me in particular. Um, I, was, I was 16 years old, and my dad called me out to have like one of those life coaching conversations with dad on the driveway. And so I, I walk out on the driveway, and he's kind of trying to direct me in the path that I'm going for you know, my high school career and a, eventually what I would set up to be doing in college because I had these big dreams, big dreams of becoming a cake decorator. And I I don't think that I really was tuned into a lot of that conversation. You know, as a teenager, I was probably uh, propped up against like the side of the house and saying, yeah, 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 after a a couple of sentences that he would spoke, pretending like I was engaged. And I do remember this, though, that my my ears kind of just like perked up when I heard him say this. He was like, you know, Jesse, you can be whatever you want to be. You can be a a teacher or a a doctor or a car mechanic or a retail store worker, or you can be a cake decorator. But I think God has something more for you than to just simply be one of those things. He said, you you have like this natural talent of, of making kids feel like they have a purpose. And I think your creativity needs to be poured out onto things more than just a cake. And I was starting to think, you know, yeah, what if? What if I was made for ministry? But that thought just kind of floated around and it didn't really sink in. And so I decided that I was going to go to business school. Because if I didn't know what I wanted to be now, in the four years that I was there, I could kind of decide what my path was going to be, and that's exactly what I did. In those four years, I I got to have the opportunity to serve in the zone alongside Hollis and Lisa Little. That gave me opportunities that changed my life. And as soon as I graduated from college, I decided to um, interview with different places that needed a children's pastor. And I was was so excited about these opportunities and about what God was doing in my life. And I I wanted to share uh, share that with someone. And so I I had a lunch with my dream crusher. I I called up one of my high school friends. 
and I said, hey, hey, let's go get some food because I, I need to talk to you about what God's doing in my life. And I began to pour out and say that these opportunities were open for me and I was so excited about them. And she, she looked at me and she said, oh, okay. Um, but what makes you think that they would pick you over somebody that maybe has a like, degree in Christian studies? And I said, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's because I have a little bit of experience. I'm not really sure. She said, oh, okay. So um, what makes you think that they would pick you because you don't even have a kid of your own? So what makes you think that they would put you in charge of a bunch of kids? And I said, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't really know. And she said, oh, okay. So you think that they would hire a 21-year-old without a degree in that field and without a kid of their own to be in charge of a children's ministry? I don't know if, if my church would do that, but you're great, so definitely go for it. I was like, wow, I'm fully encouraged today. And so I went to um, a couple of interviews that week for some positions, and a couple days later, they were met with uh, two rejection emails. And I remember believing every single word that my friend had said. And in doing so, I, I let my dream become dormant. And I decided that instead of pursuing that, what I was going to do is, you know, just try to get any position that I could. And later on, when people would ask me what I did for a living, I, I would just say, I'm a sales associate. You're going to meet people in your life at various points that are going to be angry or they're going to be insecure or they're, they're going to be jealous or they're going to be suffering and, and they're going to take that out on you. They're going to try to tell you that you're not good enough. And they're going to try to tell you that, that you're nothing and tear you down and make you believe the things that they say. But I would advise you to not let those things set up camp inside your head so that when you're feeling particularly vulnerable, that those are the words that you hear. You know, someone could be at the beginning stages of building their life, just, just trying to get their feet wet. And your words are powerful. Do you really want to be that spouse or, or that sibling or that friend or that coworker? Because when people are at the beginning stages of building, that's when they want to quit. Studies show that 20% of people that start out in the job quit before the first 90 days. That means one in five people don't actually make it past the first three months. Studies show that in January, 80% of people that sign up for a gym membership aren't seen back there in June. And 50% of marriages end in divorce. We need now, more than ever, to be people who support other people. Because there are marriages and there's kids and there's friends that need to be told that they're able and that they're strong and that they can do it. So we need to expect opposition, but we also need to make sure that we're people that build each other up. So I challenge you to encourage the people around you because they're in the beginning stages of building and it's not easy. The last question of this verse, I, I left out because I, I thought it was like really, it cut a little deeper than the other one. It says, the enemy is telling these builders, he said, can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Some of you may be seeing yourself as that rubble and might be asking yourself the same questions. Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? I think you can hear like the arrogance and 
and the loathing and the contempt in the enemy's voice as he's saying those things to the people. And he's saying, you know what? That's just trash. It's burned. God can never do anything with that as burned as it is. And I wonder if you've ever been burned. Maybe it's by the church or a relationship or maybe it hits close to home like family. And you're thinking, you know what? How can God take something so burned and build something with it? How can God take something so broken and restore it? And I'm telling you that that's God's specialty. You see, Lazarus, he was dead, like dead dead, like days dead, right, in the tomb. And, and Jesus shows up on the scene, and he says, wake up. And Lazarus walks out of the grave. Mary and Mary run to the tomb where Jesus has been crucified and then laid to rest for three days also dead dead and they show up on the scene and there is an angel that's standing at the entrance and he says why do you look for the living among the dead what i'm trying to tell you is that it's god's specialty to bring what is dead and bring it back to life you see what we think is rubble god sees the reality of what could be if we just invited him into the process. You know, we need to be prepared for opposition. But we also need to know that God is in the business of raising your rubble. Nehemiah says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it had reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But then Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Amorites, and the people of Ashdod, all of the enemies heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps had been closed, and they were very angry. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Here we see that instead of an answer, Nehemiah made an appeal. Instead of answering the enemy, he decided, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to force. I'm not going to chase. I'm not going to beg. Instead, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to have faith. Nehemiah took it before the Lord, and he said, God, I confess that it's, it's getting a lot harder the work is getting harder in proportion to the building. Now, all of these enemies are starting to get really loud in our head. And Nehemiah, that the only thing that he knew how to do to turn up God's volume was to pray. And that's exactly what he did. Because when they were halfway there, opposition started inviting itself inside. When they were halfway there, opposition started introducing itself to the people of Judah, saying, hey, remember me? Your good pal, your old friend? I've decided to stay a while. Opposition started taking off its shoes and, and making itself feel right at home. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there was so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before we know it, or before they know it, or see us, we'll be right there among them, and we'll kill them and put the end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told them ten times over, wherever that you turn, they will attack us. One thing I've learned is that people will believe that they're done when they still have strength 
left within them. People will, will throw in the towel. They'll give up even when they still have maybe a little bit extra to give. I think about this um, in regards to, you know, my, uh, my, my baby sister. She's, you know, to say the least, like, overdramatic. And I think we all have one of those people in our family, and now everybody's turning, they're looking at that person in the family, and then now it's you. You are the person, right? Um, so, like, with her, like, growing up, it's like, you get a paper cut and like we have to go to the hospital, you know? Or like she can never just be hungry. She's like starving. Or she can't just be, you know, tired. She has to be exhausted. And, and these are the people that are surrounding Nehemiah. Now, not just the enemy that is on the outside, now it's the people that are close to him are saying these things. They're going, you know what? <laughs> Nehemiah, we're just too tired. And we're too exhausted. Oh, and do you remember that those guys, they said that they want to kill us? Oh, yeah, we're so tired. We're so exhausted. And, oh, Nehemiah, yeah, those guys, they said they want to kill us. Oh, Nehemiah, if I haven't told you already, those guys, they want to kill us. Yeah, so in order to, like, make sure that he was fully discouraged, like, they come and they're telling him, like, ten times over about the opposition that is on the outside. And it's as if, like, oil is getting poured into an ocean. The, the builders' minds just became bleak. And now the camp was contaminated. Now the very people that are surrounding Nehemiah are now the people that are discouraging him. Because they were ready to just tap out. They said, you know what? Our strength is fading, and there's too much rubble to rebuild. Fatalism started to set in as they thought, you know what, there, there's no hope, and there's no way out because the enemy is surrounding us. And I wonder if you've, you've said those things or if you've been in that place. You know what, I've been too burned. God can do Nothing more to rebuild my life. My strength, I don't have more to give. I don't have another month. I'm just too tired. Nehemiah took a breath, and after placing it before the Lord, he says, Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. I hope that those words just echo in your head as you're falling asleep at night and you're, you're remembering those words of your coworker who's saying, you know what, you're good at your job, but you're probably never going to be noticed by our boss for that promotion, and you're probably going to be stuck in the same mundane routine for the rest of your life. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Even when you're sitting on the edge of your bed after you've just gotten in a fight with your spouse, and you're remembering how your parents said that marriage was too hard. And now you're beginning to think maybe it is too. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Maybe it's when you're brushing your teeth to get ready for your day of, of work or of school or to take care of those crazy kids again and you're thinking, you know what? I am too tired and I am too stressed and I'm too weak to have to deal with this again today and again tomorrow. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. If those words become your anthem, it's going to shake the foundations that you stand on and it's going to change the life of not only you, but of your family and of your friends and I want to prove it to you. You see, when I was a, a child, we went to a different church, and there was a lead pastor change. 
And my parents were um, a part of the leadership team and a part of staff, and um, they decided, you know, it, it was best for us to go separate directions. And I remember my mom just, just being broken. And I remember her feeling as if she had lost her voice. And she was a lot more cautious about trusting people. So we started this process of church shopping. But I think everyone would have understood if my parents had said, you know what, we're going to take a break from church. Or if they had said, you know what, instead of going to church this week, what we're going to do is we're going to just have more family time, and we're going to regroup, and we're going to think about what's to come in the future. Because it had to be hard and a little bit intimidating to start all the way over, to meet new people and new personalities and get involved in a new community. Because when you think your friends are forever and then all of a sudden they're not, that kind of cut can run pretty deep. But my parents, my mom and my dad, they didn't let us stay at home, not even for one Sunday, because they knew that this was too important to quit halfway. They said, you know what? I know that me, me and my three sisters, we needed them to not give up. We needed them to not quit. And as if it was God designed, God brought us to Pink Elementary where Genesis Metro Church was at the time and, and we got introduced to the Bourne family who by faith had come to Frisco, Texas with a dream of starting a church that valued people so much so that lives would be changed. And, and Tim had to work for California Pizza Kitchen for a little bit there, and, and Carrie was a working mom with a, a car that didn't even go in reverse. And they started um, hosting people within the walls of their own homes. And I can imagine that, that people probably thought that they were crazy, maybe a little bit reckless even. They probably had th their doubters and their discouragers. But I think everybody in this room would call them brave. Brave for continuing despite what people would say. Brave for showing up for people, even if that meant that they needed to go to a house to pray over someone in, in the late hours of the night, or if it meant that they needed to deliver a dinner to a family that was just swamped in the busyness of the week. Brave for, for caring about the outcomes and the futures of the people in Frisco, Texas, that, that they would be willing to, to invite and to provide an opportunity for people to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And I stand before you today as a product of steadfast parents and of a church that decided that it was worth it to pour into a middle school girl. And 10 years later, I get to stand before you with a dream that is no longer dormant. And when people ask me what I do for a living, I get to say I'm a children's pastor. So don't give up because you're halfway there. If you need that extra push or that little bit of courage, I'm telling you that God is right there, ready to help you overcome any obstacle that you might be facing. It says in Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord. This is an extra special Sunday because I think that we can see each person on this stage is here because somebody has encouraged them. Somebody has poured into them. Somebody has said, you know what? You are halfway there, but you need to not give up. 
because God is ready to help you build what you think can't be restored. God is ready to raise back to life again. So whatever, whatever fear, whatever frustration or whatever you're feeling, invite God into that process because he can help you overcome any opposition. Let's stand and let's praise our Lord together.